Good evening, and I hope, like me, you're enjoying these fantastic talks we've been listening to the whole evening on revolution. Revolution, what a unique word. If you look at it from the viewpoint of a wheel, it means going around in circles. But revolution can also mean a powerful, dramatic change in a very short period of time. This change can be political, such as the French Revolution, or technological, such as the Industrial Revolution, both of which have contributed to the world as we see it today. <clears throat> in my own field, that of audio and communications, we've had such a dramatic shift as well. Let me demonstrate. By a show of hands, how many of you recognize and have used any one of these devices? Please raise your hands. Excellent. Oh, keep it up, keep it, keep it, keep it up. If you recognize and have used any one of these devices, excellent. Keep your hands up, please. What about this? Oh. This? This? Excellent. This? Sir, I would like to talk to you because I would like to know the secret of your long life. I estimate the age range in this room to be not more than 50 years. And in that short period of time, what a progress we have made. We have gone from being attached to a wall whenever we needed to talk to someone, to being able to call people whenever we want, wherever we want. And part of that success is due to the relentless advance in miniaturization and the consequent decrease in computing power. Today, we have a computer the size of a credit card that is thousands of times more powerful than the guidance computers the astronauts use to go to the moon and back. But what does this advance actually have or mean for us in our day-to-day -day communications? When you use your smartphone to make a call from wherever you are, a pub, a cafe, metro, on the move, did you ever wonder what the signal at the microphone sounds like? Well, it sounds like this. In the course of a December tour in Yorkshire, I rode for a long distance in one of the public coaches on the day preceding Christmas. If you don't recognize this, I wouldn't be surprised because the algorithms that are in your smartphones today are clever enough to be able to separate speech from the noise so what the person at the other end of the line hears is something like this. In the course of a December tour in Yorkshire, I rode for a long distance in one of the public coaches on the day preceding Christmas. Have you ever made a recording on a phone or any other device and then realized later that your volume settings are all wrong and you obtain something like this? What can we do today? Feed it to the right algorithm, you can get this out of it. And how are we able to do this? We have trained our algorithms to find out the salient features of the signals we need and extract them from the background. Now, in the context of speech enhancement, extracting speech from noise. How do we do this? We show the algorithm several different kinds of speech signals so that it learns the characteristics of speech and it knows what to focus on and how to extract that from the background. Now in the past, I'm talking about before internet encroached on every aspect of our life. Such data was gathered by specialized companies. They would ask for volunteers from a representative sampling of the population, gather their speech data, and then, in, this was done in control conditions, curate the data and then offer them to researchers for development and testing. But think about it. This represents data from a vast sampling of the population. But communications devices are extremely personal. In fact, the major or the only user of your smartphone is you yourself. 
how much more powerful could these algorithms be if they were trained on your voice, on your characteristics? Well, in that case, even in an extremely noisy situation like this, in the course of a December tour in Yorkshire, I rode for a long distance in one of the public coaches on the day of receiving the fiscal. We can reasonably hope to extract something that sounds like this. In the course of a December tour in Yorkshire, I rode for a long distance in one of the public coaches on the day preceding Christmas. And that's the power of personal data. Now, we can obtain this data in several ways. We can do it the direct way. Whenever you buy a smartphone, the shopkeeper will tell you, here's your phone, go stand in the corner, talk to it for 10 minutes before you start using it so it learns what you sound like. And of course, if you did that, you would feel very silly doing it, and I wouldn't blame you. The other way is to ask you indirect questions. What do you think of the weather today? What do you think about the performance of your favorite, fam uh, favorite football team? What do you think of the political situation? Always a good question. And when you do that, and when you respond, we can train the algorithm on your voice characteristics, on your speech characteristics. But be careful. Such questions, indirect questions, reveal much more information about you than you think possible. Remember the small show of hands question I asked at the beginning? That has given me enough information to roughly guess your age. And this kind of indirect data is what big internet giants are after. Whenever you're on the internet and you're offered a free service, be it a social media outlet, a platform to share your photos, or to exchange email, all that you do is not, you're not getting it for free. You're paying for it in terms of your data. And these companies will gather your data and use this to build a profile of you so that they can pitch targeted offerings to you, such as that vacation you've been always dreaming of, or the designer goods you saw your neighbor wore, wearing and you wanted suddenly. And at the core of all these recommender systems are very powerful, very smart algorithms that scan through the vast amounts of data that you produce and extract only the relevant information to make a profile unique to you. And this is a huge technological leap forward. Although, if you think about it, it's mainly for commercial purposes. Now, being in the university and as an academic, I think it is a responsibility of learning institutions to harness such technology for the benefit of society. Let me talk about one specific problem, depression. Depression worldwide statistics indicate one in four people will confront it in their lifetime. There are treatments available for clinical treatments available for depression that are very effective in the short term. But the depressing problem about depression is that once you've had a depressive episode, the chances are 60 to 80% that you will fall back. And the only way to prevent this is to continuously monitor the progress of the patient. And that's practically impossible. Which doctor has time to continuously follow up on his patients? What has this got to do with audio or data that I've been discussing so far? Well, depression changes the behavior of the affected persons. They become less physically active. They withdraw from society. The way they communicate changes. The length of their speech, the utterances, the words they choose, all of it change. And these are data points that we can use to create a patient profile to follow their progress. And that's exactly what we want to do with my colleagues, Krista Munk and Marianne van der Hassel. We want to use physiological and other data gathered, oops, and I am, ah, sorry. We want to use physiological and other data that we can gather from devices such as smart watches uh, to get an, to gauge the activity of the wearer. We can analyze the speech data from their audio diaries that we will ask them to maintain. And we can use this information to create a profile unique to the patient and follow up on them continuously. And the purpose of this 
is not to present the patient with all the scary data, no. This data is to be shared with a trusted authority. In this case, the attending physician, that person has much more information at his or her hand to monitor the patient on a more or less continuous level and then decide to intervene where necessary. You know what the fun part about all of this is? The algorithms that we will use to map the data onto the patient model and to track them are the same algorithms, or very same algorithms, that are being used now to sell you your next pair of shoes or your next vacation. So, let me go back to where I started, the wheel. If you look at a rotating wheel, there are points on the wheel that appear to be moving backward. Change your perspective slightly, and you will see that this backward motion is just a small part of an overall forward trajectory. In the same way, the powerful algorithms today that are being used for such mundane, prosaic stuff can be harnessed to do something truly beneficial to society. And I hope in a couple of years to be able to stand here again and tell you about the progress we've achieved with respect to these objectives of making your data work for you to take care of you. And in today's world, isn't that a revolutionary thought? Thank you.